Well, I'll tell you what let's do. If you turn to the book of Matthew chapter 13 with me tonight, please. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 55. Scripture says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Father, bless your word now. In thy name, amen. Now the context of that, in verse number 53, it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? We didn't train him. We didn't uh, graduate him from our colleges. He's not part of our religious system. There's no way in the world he could be qualified. So they were offended in him. Right, right. Uh, you have to understand, I fully believe in training. As much education as you can get, get it, believe me. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, a lot of places, it's a matter of control. And if God calls, God provides, and God prepares, and then God qualifies. He does. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But the Lord Jesus Christ didn't fit in from the beginning because he wasn't part of the system. But was he taught in the word? Of course he was. Who taught him? The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, day after day he would awaken the power of the Holy Spirit of God, would open the scripture to him. By the time he was 12 years of age, he could confound the doctors of the law. If you remember, when they went back, they found him in the temple, and the, and the doctors of the law were sitting around listening very carefully to what this young man had to say. And, of course, he knew what to say. Time and again, he would quote the scriptures. He said, search the scriptures. Quote the scriptures. Scriptures, of course, Genesis through Malachi. He never one time quoted the Apocrypha. He never, time, he never one time quoted a pagan uh, author. He quoted the scripture time and again. Now the Apostle Paul quoted a pagan and the Apostle Paul could refer to different things but the Lord Jesus Christ only the word. And note carefully, he never appealed one time to the oral law which was the basis of the Mishnah which is the foundation for the Talmud and the Gemara and the Midrash and the Halakha and all the rest of it. Not one time did he ever appeal to the oral laws. As a matter of fact, he rebuked them. And he told them, he said, you have made the word of God of none effect by your traditions, referring to the oral law. And I've told you before, and say again tonight, there's a branch of Judaism that's called Kairite Jews. And the Kairite Jew accepts only the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, as inspired. They reject the uh, Navim and the Ketuvim, the law, and the, the, rather the prophets and the writings. Uh, they reject it as uh, canonical scripture, only the five books of Moses, Kairite Jew. And same with the Samaritans and their Samaritan Pentateuch. That's as far as it goes. There's a lot out there today that say the Jews constructed their own Old Testament to create their own identity, and this gets into liberalism, and they say that uh, Daniel never really existed, and that uh, Israel was nothing but a backwoods country, tribal people, and that uh, they created all of this, and by doing it, they created their prophets and their writings and the Psalms and the Proverbs and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the rest of it. So you have to make a decision tonight. Do you believe the Bible? I believe all 66 books of it, right? Yes, sir. 39 Old Testament, 27 New. The book of Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 20, it says this, Matthew 8, 20. 
Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He never owned any property, and the very robe that he wore, they took and cast lots for it uh, when he was on the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ was not rich with monetary, with money of men, uh, but he was rich beyond measure, believe me. He said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where it can't be touched and moth and so forth cannot take it from you. The prosperity gospel is appealing and most of the people that I've ever known since I've been in the church have prospered. God has prospered me. He has blessed me. And you live in an affluent society. You live in a nation where if you apply yourself, you more than likely will be able to make a good living if you really do, if you apply yourself. There's a lot of uh, potential in America. But the truth of the matter is, God didn't save you to make you wealthy. He saved your soul to write your name, the Lamb's Book of Life. The book of John, chapter number 1 and verse number 46, he says this. John 1, 46. John chapter number 1 and verse number 46. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. So Nazareth had a reputation. The Lord Jesus was called a Nazarene. It had a reputation. So I believe intentionally he associated himself with the wrong side of the tracks. He didn't want to be accepted because of what men considered to be valuable. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. He was accepted because of the revelation of the Father. He said to them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's what's important. Who is he tonight? He's not a rich man's Savior or a poor man's Savior. He's the Savior. He doesn't care how much money you got and who you are, where you came from. So uh, he, uh, he, of course, made that decision. Look at John chapter number 7 and verse number 15. John 7 and verse 15. And the Jews marvel, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? You see, he did not sit under, under Gamaliel, or he didn't sit under uh, Hillel, or he didn't sit under some of the greatest teachers and rabbis and sages of the day. He didn't sit under them. He didn't need to. The Bible says of us Christians, this is important tonight, folks. The Apostle John says in 1 John, you have no need that a man teach you. You have an anointing from the Father. All right, now it says in the Scripture to commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What's that mean? That means that a newborn babe in Christ needs instruction and direction, and you need to help them as they learn the Bible. But you should come to a point in your life as a Christian where you can discern, you can discern heresy, and you should be able to discern uh, the uh, uh, when when people are twisting the scriptures to their own destruction. You don't need. You've got the Holy Spirit, and when you hear some new thing, uh, take it before God. Do some serious praying about it. You'll discover that uh, novel things, and that's what people are looking for. They're like the Picureans and the Stoics over there in in, in Greece. Uh, they were waiting for some new thing. And uh, they said of the Apostle Paul, said, who is this babbler? Uh, as he brings some new doctrine in amongst us. They were waiting. That's what they did all day long. They argued over new things, something novel. All right. Well, this is what some Christians do. They go from one place to the next looking for something new. Do you know why they do that? It's because what they have isn't base substantial. It's not real. It's not a real foundation. Christ is what we love, and he's the one who we go after. He's the one we seek. It's him, and it's about him. And that's what's all important to us. So when you have someone like Judge Rutherford, who comes in the 1800s and says that Christ is a created God, or you have someone who comes along and says, well, he's an avatar. You hear a lot of that today. You hear, you hear things that change like he's an ascended master, and Christ is this great teacher or that great teacher. What they're doing is connecting the Lord Jesus with the New Age movement, they're connecting him with witchcraft. They're connecting him with Hinduism. Do you remember the Russian that went off into uh, 
not a check or not a not a check. I think his name was. He went off into into uh, into the into India, uh, back up into the into the monasteries, and and supposedly said that he saw some ancient writings where Jesus two thousand years ago had come as a boy, and he came under the tutelage of one of their gurus and taught him all these things where he went back to his people and he could perform miracles. Authority for that he has none. And it was followed up, and they went up there, and they checked in these same places that he'd gone to, asked the people who ran these places, and they said, no such thing ever existed. We don't have anything here about Jesus of Nazareth. And of course they don't, but that's the problem. Somebody's looking for some new thing all the time, some new move of God. Let me tell you something. 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and sent the Holy Ghost into this world. And we would do well to learn about the Holy Spirit of God. He said in John chapter number 3, you must be born again. Now, here's what he said about that. As the wind listeth, or as it bloweth, thou canst not tell from whence it cometh, or whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit of God. All right? In plainer words, there is no set standard, no set method, no set channel for the Holy Spirit to come and begin to move upon the heart of a man or a woman. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But he said plainly, the Holy Ghost is absolutely necessary for you to be born again. Can't happen otherwise. The Holy Spirit must be there because you're born of the Spirit. And we need to learn about the Holy Spirit then. And this is part of what we do is learning. Look at the book of Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 51. Luke chapter 2 verse 51. The scripture says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Now, who are the them? We're looking back at his mother and his stepfather. But his mother kept all these things or sayings in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And he was being prepared for his ministry at the right hand of the Father as the great high priest. The priest is the one who ministers the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into this world and ministers directly from the command and commission of the Father and the Son. Amen. He's here working exactly as the Father and Son send him into the world. He said, I'll send you the Spirit. And so the Lord Jesus at the right hand of the Father, Romans chapter number 8, ministers to you through the Holy Ghost in such a close fashion that the Bible says if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. The Holy Spirit takes literally the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what He does. So it tells us right here that He subjected Himself unto His mother's authority as His mother. That wouldn't last but so long because on the cross at Calvary, if you'll remember, the Lord Jesus looked at His mother and said, Woman, and this was not in disrespect. He was setting her right. He was saying to her, Mary, you're my mother and I love you, but you must be born again also. Yes, I do not believe in the immaculate conception of Mary. That's a Roman Catholic doctrine. I do, they, what does that mean? That means that they teach that she was born without sin, born uh, without original sin, and not, born, not being born according to the according to what Adam brought into this world in the book of Romans chapter number 5. That's what, they, that's what they teach, you see. And by teaching that, then she doesn't need to be a savior, doesn't need to be saved, she becomes a savior. It is her voice into the ear of her son, according to the Catholic teaching, that gets the ear of the son because the son loves his mother and he'll hear his mother when he won't hear anyone else. That's the doctrine. That's the idea. But folks, where's that in the Bible? There's one God, and how many mediators? One, between God and men. The woman or the man? The man, Christ Jesus. Right, so you gotta be careful. Confess your sins, you're a royal priesthood and all that, but you do not need someone to absolve you of your sins. That was done at the cross in the blood of Christ as we just sang about a few minutes ago. What can wash away my sin? 
Revelation chapter number one, verse number five. Who hath loosed us from our sins. That's what it says, right? No, that's what the new Bibles say. They changed luo to lauo. Or the other way around. I can't, I can't even remember which way it goes. But one means wash. The other means loose. So what does your Bible say in Revelation 1.5? He hath washed us from our sins in his own blood, right? Well, does that mean, therefore, that there needs to be blood? You got these people teaching that there is no blood in heaven, that Christ did not enter with his own blood. The blood is simply a type or, or a figure of the perfect life that he lived. Listen, folks, you are not saved by the life of Christ. The way he lived his perfect sinless life, you have liberalism out there that says we just mimic or follow the life of Christ and we'll be okay if we'll live like Christ. You can't do that. You don't have the capacity to do that. He lived a sinless, perfect life. So how are you saved? You mean you're not saved by the life of Christ? No, you're saved by his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, the Bible says plainly that you are saved by his life in the sense that at his order, at the right hand of the Father, as the high priest for us, ministering for us, he saves your daily life, not your eternal soul and spirit. That's what he's talking about there. That's important. That's a big deal. Because there's an awful lot of people out there that believe by keeping the Sermon on the Mount, and they can't do it, and by keeping the commandments, and they can't do it, and by living a, what they consider to be a sinless, perfect life, that one day God will reward them in heaven for having lived a perfect life. But the Apostle Paul says, I'm of all the sinners the chief. The Apostle John says in 1 John chapter number 1 that if you say you have not sinned, you call God a liar. And the Lord Jesus said to them, drug the woman taken in adultery, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Time and time again, it makes it plain. There is no one on this earth that is sinless. There's only one who lived a sinless, perfect life. And that's the Lord Jesus. And so therefore he is the only Savior. In John chapter number 5 and verse number 30, And don't misunderstand dedication because there are people out there that live every day of their life is in, 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 in as an exemplary uh, possible way to live as sinless as they possibly can, but they still fail, folks. It can't be done. In John chapter number, uh, John chapter number five, verse number 30, here's what it says. I can of mine own self do nothing. All right, let's stop for just a moment. What did he tell us? He told us in John chapter number 15. He says, without me, ye can do what? Nothing. So he's not asking anything of us that he didn't do himself. He put himself completely at the disposal of the Father and could only do what he did by the power of the Holy Spirit of God that God gave him without measure and every deed that he did, every miracle he performed, all the perfect life that he lived, he lived it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God given to him without measure because he's the only one that has ever had the Holy Ghost without measure. When the Lord gave me the Holy Spirit, he had to do some measuring. <laughs> I'm only capable of holding so much. It can only fill me so much. But when it came to Christ, oh no. No, no. And that was the, res the reciprocal moving of the Holy Spirit in his life too. But anyway, he, uh, he said, I can do nothing. The Apostle Paul said this. He says, I am nothing. And that's true. I am nothing. What does that mean? My identity comes from as I relate to Christ and who I am. Our identity is one of the biggest things of who we are. You ever watch how people... What they do when, they have, when it has to do with their names, the crowd they run with, their genealogy, all these other, where they went to school, all these things have to do with their identity. And the identity changes from generation to generation to generation to generation. It's such a big deal. So here we read, and uh, we read over here in the book of John, uh, John chapter number 8. Now let's see. No, Luke 23. Uh, Luke chapter number 23. Luke 23, verse 34. 
Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. All right. Now, they knew they were crucifying a man, but they didn't know who he was. You see? You remember this? Think about it for a minute. You know what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It is to reject the direct light that the Holy Spirit is giving you of who Christ is. Outright reject it and say no to that revelation from God. Because your relationship with God is built entirely upon who the Son of God is. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. One of the greatest studies in the Bible is the study of light as you find it in the Gospel of John. And in John chapter number one, he says this, he is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now let's just stop for a moment and think about that. Do you remember what I told you about tulip? Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, Irresistible grace and predestination. It's the acronym for those five things. All right. That defines hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism believes that God chose in eternity past to make a creature, a man, and one day burn him in hell forever and never give him an opportunity to be saved because he, by his sovereign will and grace, chooses who's going to be saved and who's not. Now that is the predestination and that's the act of a sovereign God according to hyper-Calvinism. So what does that do to you? That takes your choice away, right? Now come back to John 1. He's the light that lighteth the elect. See what do you mean? Look what's happening. He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, here we go. We are messing with Calvin's corpse, you see. In plain words, according to hyper-Calvinism, you don't have the ability to answer or respond or any sense like that. You, you don't have that ability. God must reach out and choose you and call you in order for you to be saved. Make no mistake. He certainly does reach out and choose and call. Election is a Bible doctrine. But what about the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world? If there's no way, that, if there's nothing in you to answer, what's that? So what you do, get your 15 commentaries down, and they'll run you in 15 different directions. Well, coming into the world, he is the light of the world. One of them will say it that way. What's they done? What have they done? They've completely changed the meaning of it, right? And the grammar won't let them do it, but they're going to do it anyway because they want to support their, their theology. So you mean to tell me, preacher, that when I was born, I was brought into this world, that there was a light that lights every man that cometh into the world? Define that light? I can't define it, but I believe what the Bible says. I believe that you're accountable for what you do with that light. I believe that light is absolutely necessary for God to relate to you. The Bible says, neither cometh they to the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil, right? They refused the light. The Lord Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. That's what he said. And in the book of John, he mentions that day with a great light. The great, he was the great light that lighteth all men, the great feast of lights, and the Lord Jesus standing in the midst of it, the light of the world. The more light you have from God, the more accountable you are, and the more light you have from God, the more light he gives you if you accept the light you get. That's the doctrine. That's the key. Why don't you look at something? Look at Romans chapter number 2. Now, I'll just do these here along the way. And we'll close with this tonight. Let's look at verse 11, Romans 2, 11. 
There's no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law, ignorant of the law, shall also perish without law. The wages of sin is what? See, it doesn't, it doesn't excuse that. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be done what? Judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now watch this, verse 14. Now remember where you are. What happens in the first chapter of the book of Romans? When they knew God, they did what? They glorified him not as God, became vain in their imaginations, foolish heart was darkened, right? They were turned into dark, away from the light, ignorance. They rejected God. That's exactly what's happened to the good old U.S. of A. It's had the light, but it's turned from it, it's rejected it, and now what are they doing? They're stumbling in darkness. All right. This is exactly what he's talking about in Romans. But look at this. Verse 14. When the Gentiles, so there's no mistaking this. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, so if you don't have the law, you're not judged by the law. Is that what he just told you? Of course he did which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, so there is a natural law written in the heart of a man. These having not the law are what? A law unto themselves. Now look at verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Where do you get hyper-Calvinism to fit in here? You don't. It won't fit. Look at verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by my gospel. All right. Now go to John chapter number 9. I'm going to give you just enough tonight so you go home and say, what's he talking about? <laughs> John 9. Man born blind. All right. In typology, who does he represent? He represents Israel. He's born blind. What happens? The Lord Jesus Christ takes the curse of the earth, remember that makes mud, dirt, cursed it as the ground, puts it on his eyes, all right? He's born blind. The curse is on his eyes. He can't see. He goes down to the pool of Siloam. The word Siloam means sent. So the water sent from God, like the Holy Spirit, he washes the eye, the mud comes out, the curse is washed away, and what happens? He sees. All right, now look at the last few verses of John 9. Verse 39. For judgment, I am come into this world that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Well, he doesn't come to blind the truth. He comes to blind this religious profession where you say you see and you have, don't have Christ. You don't see. You're blind. But anyway, look at verse 40. Some of the Pharisees were with him, heard these things and words, and said unto him, Are we blind also? Now look at verse 41. Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should what? Now, look at this. Now, let's stop for a moment. Is he telling them they're sinless? Of course not. He's telling them that you cannot be held accountable, all right, for what you don't know. That's what he just said. He said, but if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Well, they, what have they done? They've rejected the light. That's what's happened to them. That they've rejected it. And then over here in John 15, I think it is. And remember these things are written that you might believe. John chapter number 15. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'll have to look this up. I never could remember exactly where this text was, but it's in 15. Uh... Well, the comforters come. All right. I can't find it right now, but it supports what I just read to you. 
6, 26. Yeah, that's the spirit of truth. He's coming to testify. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll find it when I get home. <laughs> I'll guarantee it. It'll pop right up. So it, what it does, it repeats what I just read to you from John 9. Uh, okay. Let's see. There it is. We have somebody with sharp eyes. Who got that? Good. You got that right. This is it. Now look at it. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had what? They had not had sin. See this? Does he say that they are sinless? No. He's speaking to a specific thing. Now look at verse 22. But now they have no what? Cloak. There's nothing to hide behind. You've heard a clear presentation of the gospel. The light's shining. You say no to Christ. You've rejected the light. You've turned away from the light. There's nowhere to run. There's nothing to hide behind. You have, you have nothing to appeal to. You're guilty. You see how it works? God's no respecter of persons. So what do you do? Well, what the devil does is change the power of the gospel. He'll change it into some feel-good thing. He'll take away the cross and the blood. He'll take away repentance. He'll take away that part of the new birth where we preach the new birth. How, many, how much preaching do you hear today and there's nothing said about the new birth? Nothing, not a word said about the new birth. It's all about do good, do right, be good, be the best you can, you know, be a good person. And we're all doing the same thing. We're going up the, up the, up the same mountain. You're going this way, I'm going that way. And we're, we're okay, just do the best you can. Well, the best you can is not good enough, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy saved us. Well, the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit of God. No, you'll never be good enough. But what I'm doing is getting into the nuts and bolts of what it has to do with conviction and light accepted and light rejected. Not one word that's ever said in this Bible says that you are sinless. We're accountable. But how are we accountable? That's what I'm trying to show you tonight. You see, the criteria where God holds you accountable for the light that you receive or reject. Amen. So what does that do to us? Like Brother McDonald and me, any of the preachers in the house, we have a responsibility to do what? Shine the light. <laughs> yes, we do. Preach Christ and him crucified. Amen. And that's my responsibility tonight. And by the grace of God... I will. I'll close with this one, Luke chapter 15 and verse number two. Here's an awful, awful charge that they brought against Christ. What, this is a terrible thing. Luke chapter 15, verse number two. I can't believe he'd do such a thing as this. Luke chapter 15 and verse number two. What a thing, man. Luke chapter 15 and verse number two. Luke chapter 15 and verse number two. They drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Notice how they were drawn to him. Verse 2. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with him. My goodness. Isn't that awful? <laughs> Aren't you glad? It makes no difference what kind of shape you're in, how sorry and low down you are, what a load of sin you've got. He'll sit down and eat with you. Why? Because he's the friend of sinners. How many, how many would confess tonight and say honestly from your heart, you know, preacher, before I ever got saved, I could feel the hand of God in my life on occasion. I knew he was working with me. He was there with me. He was long-suffering with me. In other words, he befriended me. He was a friend to me. I got knocked 20 feet into the air on Clinton Highway. At least 20 feet. I mean, I got knocked out of my boots. And I got up and drug my motorcycle back to the side of the road, cussing and blaspheming God. But God's hand saved me that day. He was a friend to me. I could have died and gone to hell right then. But he was a friend to me. And you wouldn't believe now. I mean, I, I know you would. I have thinking spells. <laughs> I mean, just all I do is thank God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And it just starts flooding my soul of the things to thank God for. Amen. And that's one of them. That's one of them. That's one of them. 
And if you ever come close like that to dying, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll appreciate it. You'll think about it. I'm sure Donald Trump, uh, when that bullet pierced his and there's nobody on this earth. Now, I'll tell you right now that it's good enough shot with a rifle to blow off part of that man's ear intentionally. He was headed for his head. There ain't no, there's no man that I've ever known that's that good a shot. You're talking about splitting a hair. <laughs> no, God's hand saved the man. God's hand saved him. God's hand saved him. Yes, he did. No doubt in my mind. Has God ever done that for you? Amen, folks. I can take you to the spot in front of Van Slack Volkswagen. I can take you to the very spot. I left that motorcycle. Didn't intend to leave that motorcycle. But I had a, I went on a roller coaster. <laughs> Up I went, boy. Back down. I came. It's amazing. God's a good God. He's been good to me. Amen. All right. Well, I'm done. Father, bless your word, Lord. Thank you for this little time we have together. In your holy name, amen.